So this afternoon, we're looking at the Catechism, Lord's Day 49. Where the teaching of Scripture is summarized by the church and thus confessed as follows. What is the third petition? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is, grant that we and all men may deny our own will and without any murmuring obey your will, for it alone is good. Grant also that everyone may carry out the duties of his office and calling as willingly and faithfully as the angels in heaven. In response to the sermon, we'll be singing from Psalm 119 to stanzas 30 and 62. Dear children of God, brothers and sisters in Christ, and guests, I begin with two situations that will serve as illustrations at various times during this sermon. The first one is about Iris. Iris was sick, cancer. She only had six months to live the doctor said. But she wasn't old, just 55. She wasn't ready to die. She wanted to be healed. Now, Iris was a Christian. She knew Psalm 31. My times are in your hands. And so she prayed, Lord, I would dearly like to be healed to enjoy life with my husband, my children, my grandchildren. However, all things are in your hands, also my life. Lord, what have you decreed for my life? Your will be done. Second one, 38-year-old Gerard, married, father of five, an entrepreneur, and a successful one. He was doing well. He could live comfortably. He didn't need more. But then this opportunity came for him to take over another business, expand his empire. He realized doing so would mean being away from home for a week or two weeks at a time, almost every month. It wouldn't be good for his family. Now, Gerard was a Christian. He knew Deuteronomy 6. Impress my commandments upon your children. And so he prayed. Lord, I have a difficult decision to make. It's so tempting to become richer. And I have the talents to do it. But I know it will do harm to my family. Lord, what would you have me do? Your will be done. Two people, Iris and Gerard. Two problems, cancer and temptation to sin. But one request, your will be done. One request and yet so different. Which of these is now the third petition? And our focus this afternoon is on that third petition. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What does it mean? What is this will of God that has to be done? How is it being done in heaven so that it should also be done on earth? Those are some of the questions we'll be looking at this afternoon. We're instructed in God's word on the third petition with this theme. We pray that God's will may be done. We'll look at first the distinction between God's hidden and revealed will, and then secondly, the petition for God's will to be done, and then thirdly, what this petition does to us who pray it. First, God's hidden and revealed will, or if you prefer, God's decree and God's command. Hidden and revealed. Boys and girls, those are opposites. Something which is hidden is not revealed. 
something which is revealed is not hidden. And the Bible speaks about the hidden things of God and the revealed things of God. Said Moses to the Israelites, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of the law. So there are things that God has not made known to us, matters He has not shown to us. Those are the secret things of God, the hidden things of God. And there are things that God has made known to us, matters He has shown, has revealed to us. Those are the revealed things of God. And maybe some illustrations will, will help to make the distinction. We don't know when the Lord Jesus will come back. That's a secret, a hidden thing. We do know that the Lord Jesus will come back someday. That's been revealed. As a young person, you don't know whether you'll ever marry. That's a hidden thing. But if you were to marry, God wants you to marry someone of the opposite sex, and He wants you to marry in the Lord. That's revealed. But we don't know whether we'll ever become rich. That's a hidden thing. But we do know that we have to work for our daily upkeep. That's been revealed. In Moses' words, once again, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children, that we may do all the words of the law. Now what we want to do at this point is come to grips with this hidden and revealed will of God. How does that will of God work in our existence, in our everyday lives? The hidden or the secret will of God is often referred to as the will of God's decree. This is the will of God about the things that will happen, about God's counsel, about God's plans that He is executing. Without God's will, for example, says Lord's Day 10, without God's will, no creature can so much as move. God has to will it. The revealed will of God is often referred to as the will of God's command. That's in part given what Moses said to the Israelites. God has revealed things. Why? So that we may do all the things that are written in the law. God's will of decree is the hidden will. God's will of command is the revealed will. Now that's how it's commonly put. But there's actually a bit of a problem with the terminology here. You see, it's not true that the will of God's decree is always hidden. For example, Simeon, around the time when Jesus was born, Simeon knew that he would see the Messiah before he would die. This decree of God had been revealed to Simeon. So, it's not true that God's eternal decree is always hidden. That even applies actually to the classic example of God's decree, the decree of election. That's not hidden for everyone. We confess with the canons of Dort, I quote, the elect in due time are made certain of their internal and unchangeable election to salvation. The elect are made certain. See, it gets revealed. So rather than distinguish between what we do know of God's will and what we don't know of God's will, we should speak of God's will of decree and God's will of command. God's will of decree, that's about God's plans, what God has decided will happen. And God's will of command, that's about God's desires, what He wants us to do. Now again, we're looking at this issue because of the third petition, your will be done. What are we praying when we utter that request? Lord, execute your decrees, do what you've decided to do. Think of Iris having cancer. Lord, are you going to heal me or not? Or, Lord, have your commands executed. Make us people do what you want us to do. Think of Gerard, who has to take care of his children. 
So God's will of decree or God's will of command, which is it? Well, whenever you're confronted with a choice between two options, you've always got to first ask whether that choice is actually fair. Is it a false dilemma? Are the two mutually exclusive? Do we have to say it's one or the other? And to consider this, I want to make use of an illustration from the Bible. Let's reflect for a moment on the role of God's will of decree and God's will of command in relation to the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Peter says of the Lord Jesus, that's, this is in his sermon on Pentecost Day, Peter says this, This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. And the prophet Isaiah had said centuries before God's Son even walked this earth as a human being, Isaiah said, it was the Lord's will to crush him. He has put him to grief. What's this telling us? Well, the crucifixion was decreed by God. It was God's plan that Jesus should be crucified. And yet, we know that God did not want the crucifixion to happen. Because we're not allowed to condemn someone innocently to death. To return to Peter's words on that Pentecost day, he also said this, This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. And then he tells his hearers, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Or think of this. The Lord Jesus himself prayed on the cross that God might forgive those who were crucifying him. And I think forgiveness only makes sense if there's a sin that's being committed. So the crucifixion of Jesus was against the command of God. So do you sense how, how difficult this is? God has decreed something, the death of Jesus Christ by crucifixion, which he has forbidden man to bring about, because he said, you shall not murder. In terms of God's will, God wanted the death of Jesus the Christ, but he didn't want Jesus the Christ to be put to death. And that doesn't seem to make sense. But still, it's not as odd as we may think. It happened quite some years ago, almost a decade ago, that paramedics in British Columbia were on strike for a very long time. They didn't want to be on strike. Paramedics are people that want to help people. But they chose to go on strike. They decided to refuse to limit their assistance to other people. They wanted their strike, but they did not want to go on strike. And there are many examples of this, actually, in everyday life. The knife of a surgeon. The drill of a dentist. The tranquilizer of a game warden. The detention of a teacher. I happen to be a Bible teacher for grade 12. I know what that's about. The funding cuts of a government or a parent grounding a child. All examples of things that you decide to, but you don't want. Now, just to be clear, the two are not always at odds. That, that the will of decree and the will of command can actually go hand in hand. For example, God wanted Israel to live in Canaan and to destroy the heathens, and God commanded Israel to live in Canaan and destroy the heathens. It took a long time, but in the end it happened. But so just for now, let, let's take stock. We've learned a few things about this will of God. We, we've learned there's a will of God's decree. In general, it's unknown to us. It's hidden from our knowledge. It, it's that question of Iris, will I get better or will I die? And then there's the will of God's command. It is known. It has been revealed. It relates to questions such as that of Gerard. What am I supposed to do in this situation? 
we've seen that those two wills are related to each other. We can distinguish them, but we shouldn't separate them. But for all the things that have been said so far, we still haven't got an answer to our question. What are we praying when we say, your will be done? Do we pray, God, please execute your decree? Or do we pray, God, have us fulfill your command? Is it, God, you do what you want? Or is it, God, have us do what you want? And that brings us to our second thought, the petition for God's will to be done. Cyprian, a church father of the third century, he said, we do not pray to God to do what He wants, but to have us do what He wants. In other words, it's, it's got nothing to do with the way Iris prayed. Lord, please heal me. That's what I want. But I realize you decide, and if you've decided differently, that's fine by me. Your will be done. No, Cyprian says, that's not the meaning of the petition. No, it, it's the way Gerard prayed it. Lord, I, I know what I like. I want to be rich, but I realize you've given me certain duties in life. You've commanded me that I, I fulfill my duties as a father. Lord, your will be done. Now, it's not only Cyprian who made this distinction. During the time of the Reformation, this was repeated. For example, in his Institutes of the Christian Religion, John Calvin writes this, Here is not a question of God's secret will, by which He controls all things and directs them to their end, but here God's other will is to be noted, namely that to which voluntary obedience corresponds. And the Heidelberg Catechism is in line with that. We don't read anything in Lord's Day 49 that fits with people like Iris. Rather, it's as Gerard prayed. Grant that we and all men, without any murmuring, obey your will. And the Rhine version of the third petition, as we have it in the book of praise, follows that line as well. May we deny our willful way, and without murmuring, you obey. So the conclusion would seem to have to be, if you pray, your will be done. You're not praying, Lord, do whatever you want, whether you would have me live or die. I'm fine with your choice. Your will be done. No. The person is praying, Lord, help me not to sin, but to fulfill your commands. And so the third petition would then not be about resigning one, oneself to God's decree, but about obedience to God's command. But it can't be as simple as that. What I just described is how I used to think. I've even preached it that way. But I've always run stuck on the Lord Jesus praying this petition in the Garden of Gethsemane. What we read from Scripture. What was Jesus praying? My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Many understand this prayer as follows. Lord, so this is Jesus praying. Lord, I'm scared. I wish I didn't have to die, but I do realize that you have a different plan. You want me to die, and so I will. I am resigned to your decision. Don't bother yourself with what I want. This petition would then be about Christ resigning himself to God's decree. And if that were true, then his prayer is not related to the third petition at all. But now take a Bible and, and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews 5, verse 7 and 8. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears 
to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Now, this is clearly a reference to the prayer of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. And now note that the author of Hebrews not only links this petition to the concept of submission, but also to the concept of obedience, even of learning obedience. And what's interesting is that John Calvin, when he makes a commentary on Matthew 26, he does the same thing. Two quotes from that. Calvin first writes, This is the reason why Jesus prays to be spared death, then holds himself in, check, submits himself to the Father's command, and correct and revokes, yes, corrects and revokes the wish that had suddenly escaped him. But a little later, Calvin writes this, We must hold to the rule that when we have no certain and special promise, we must not ask anything except on condition that God may fulfill his decree, which cannot be done unless we yield our wishes to his instruction. First, Calvin says, submit himself to the Father's command, and then he says that God may fulfill his decree. What's all this mean? Well, maybe it means we're trying to be too methodical. We're trying to be too clever, too schematic with all of this. Are our distinctions with respect to God's will maybe artificial? And thinking those things through and pondering them, we discover it gets even more complex. Because have you ever realized that there are things which God has decreed that we're not allowed to pray for to happen? And that there are things which God has decreed to not happen, and we still have to pray for them to happen? For example, imagine for a moment that the disciples of Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, if they had listened well to Jesus, they would have known what was going to happen. That it was God's plan for Jesus to be taken captive, to be crucified. Now, would God have wanted, for example, the disciple John to pray that evening, Lord, the moment has come, please let Judas betray Jesus. Please have Jesus delivered into the hands of the Sanhedrin, and have the Sanhedrin hand Jesus over into the hands of the Romans, and have the Romans do their cruel things and crucify Jesus. For that is your will, and your will be done. No. That, that asking God to have people sin. Or the opposite. We know that God has decreed that all men will struggle with sin as long as they are on this side of the grave. We know that. And yet we will pray at the start of every day, Lord, keep us from sin. Have us obey your will. We know we're going to fail. God's told us that. And still we realize God wants us to pray that we don't sin. Brothers and sisters, when you think through the logic of some of this, you realize it's not simple. When I first wrote this sermon, I wasn't so sure, how, how am I going to tackle this? And I can well imagine that many of you are totally confused by it all. But that confusion is actually a good thing. Because we people, we like to have things nice and tidy and easy to understand, you know, like God's hidden will, God's revealed will, God's will of decree, God's will of command, but it's not that simple. If you've been listening closely, you'll have noticed that I refer to God's will sometimes in the plural, in the sense of God actually has two wills, a revealed will and a hidden will, a will of command and a will of decree. But that's actually unscriptural. God is one. His will is one. 
With Belgian Confession Article 1, we confess that God is a simple being. What that means is His simplicity implies a singularity of will. Singularity of will. That means God only has one will. And so, brothers and sisters, for a moment, forget Iris and her cancer, but also forget Gerard and his business. Those illustrations make things confusing because they oversimplify. We should not get hung up on the word will. What we've got to focus on is on the expression, be done. That's actually the focal point of what Moses said, that we may do the words of the law. It's the focal point of Christ's teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Those who hear and do. The third petition is, your will be done. You see, when God's perfect will collides with our imperfect world, that's when the tension arises. Even when a perfect man, Jesus the Christ, who said, my will is to do the will of my Father, when he finds himself in an imperfect world, that's when tension arises. It's sin. It's our fallen state and everything associated with, with the misery that comes with that. That's what makes it so difficult. Our imperfect world creates the complexity of this petition. There's one place in the world where that tension doesn't exist. It's a place in creation where everything is perfect. And the third petition tells us itself. God's decree is always executed in heaven. God's command is always obeyed in heaven. Because there's no sin in heaven. There's nothing which prevents God's will from being done. The angels, they are ever willing and ever obedient. There are no circumstances in the, in the picture of heaven which will stand in the way of God's will being done. But our world, our planet Earth, it's a very different place. There's sin here. We're sinful ourselves. We don't always know what to do. And even if we did, like Christ did, circumstances in our world can have our desires clash with those of God. Your will be done. When we say those words, we're asking God to execute His decrees via His commands. See it? It's both. God, do what you want by having us do what you want. It's both. It's not resigning yourself to God's will. It's also not a matter of just being obedient. It's both. And that brings us to our last thought. What does this petition do to us when we pray it? Our Lord Jesus prayed, your will be done. That was related to God's decree. Jesus knew that God had decided that Jesus would die on the cross. Psalm 22, Isaiah 53 said as much. Jesus knew it. Anybody could know it. But Jesus also knew that this was now a command for him. When the time comes, he may not resist. And so when Peter pulls his sword to fight for Jesus, Jesus says, put your sword back in your place. How, how would the Scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? Must happen in this way, that's God's decree. Be fulfilled, that's God's command. The petition, your will be done, will first of all be a desire for God's commandments. We're asking God, God, have us live for you with heart and soul. Have us deny our own will. Have us acknowledge God's will, for it alone is good. Not wanting to embezzle funds because God says you shall not steal. Not looking at pornography, for the Lord says you shall not commit adultery. Not bullying a classmate because God says you shall not murder. A deep desire to keep the law of God. Because keeping the law of God, that is fulfilling the will of God. But then also not just doing it because you have to. Like, well, I'm in church this afternoon because I have to be. Not because I want to be. Now those who pray the third petition are in fact asking God, God, change me. 
Don't only make me go to church this afternoon, but make me also want to be in church this afternoon. Don't only make me be faithful to my spouse, but make me want to be faithful to my spouse. Don't only make me keep my mouth shut about my neighbor's faults, but make me want to keep my, ma my mouth shut. It's not just about the hands and about the head. It's about the heart as well. Lord, conform my will, that's in here, unto your will. But sometimes we don't know what the will of God exactly is. And by the way, often we do and we don't want to admit it to get out of a situation. Let's not kid ourselves. But yet, there, there are times where we truly do not know. I've known lots of people like Iris. Some wanted to die, and they're still alive, suffering. Some wanted to live, but they passed away to a newer life, leaving grieving relatives behind, children with just a mum. How should we pray? Your will be done. What do we mean? The same as Christ. Say what's on your mind. God listens. God listened even when the unimaginable happened. When the Son of God, now a human being, admitted that he did not really want what God wanted. And then when you've said what's on your mind, act responsibly. Don't be fatalistic and resign everything passively into God's hands. Don't be activistic and try to force God to do what you want. No, weigh the possibilities God gives. Take God's explicit commands into consideration and go with that. Dare to say and dare to mean amen when you are done praying. And when you do that, beloved, that gives you peace. Then you'll have peace with God's decree. Oh sure, what, what happens will no doubt agitate our old man. We're not perfect like Christ was. But if we strive for obedience, and if we submit to God's decree, then we'll have peace with whatever happens. Because we will not be held responsible for what ills may take place. No more than Christ was responsible for the betrayal by Judas, even though he said to Judas, do what you have to do. Or responsible for the wrongful condemnation of the Sanhedrin. Or how Pontius Pilate perverted the course of justice. At bottom, the third petition is a prayer for the new creation. Just like the petition, your kingdom come. And the petition, your name be hallowed. A new creation in which there is no tension between God's decree and God's command. In which the web of iniquity doesn't complicate our lives. Yes, as in heaven, so on earth. The third petition is asking God to create heaven on earth. We pray that God's will may be done. Iris, she's cancer. She's confident that God can turn to our good whatever he sends us in this life of sorrow. And she's doing her best to be obedient. And Gerard and his riches confident that God can renew us according to the image of Christ and doing his best to have peace with God's plans for his life. Beloved, whatever your circumstances, whatever your questions, whatever your concerns, Christ teaches us to pray, your will be done. Hear and do as Christ teaches. May your request to God incite you to a greater love for God's law. May it increase your faith, your trust in God and his plans for you as you place your life, as you place your whole being in his hands. For the third petition says, as in heaven, so on earth. And you know what? It's going to happen. Heaven is coming to earth. Amen.